So it's been an open secret for quite a while now, but the appointment of Richard Hughes as Liverpool's new sporting director has finally been confirmed. Obviously, as soon as Michael Edwards was appointed by FSG as their new CEO of football, it seemed a bit of an open and shut case, really, that his old friend Richard Hughes would come in and follow him to be the new sporting director at Liverpool. But... There is a little bit more to it than that. It's not just a case of jobs for the boys. It's really Hughes has been sought out because of his expertise and his past career. And so I thought it was worth jumping on and having a look at where he's been, what he's done before, what's led him to Anfield and how his relationship with Edwards first started. And also, you know, will he look at whether he'll be an astute appointment for Liverpool and what we can kind of expect from him as a sporting director. So I think as we look at that, maybe the best place to start is those links between Edwards and Hughes and, and how they first started. And and it's well known that they were both at Portsmouth together under Harry Redknapp. Obviously, Hughes was a player, a defensive midfielder, and also the club captain at that time, where Edwards was a, an analyst who'd come in from ProZone and, and was kind of trying to invite people to in football to, to look at this new technical side of things and how technology and statistics can help inform things on the pitch. You think how far football's come now. He was working in, in a very different environment back then in terms of football having a bit of scepticism around numbers, but that wasn't completely widespread. It wasn't the case that everybody rejected that and actually it's quite interesting that Richard Hughes you know we're told is one of those people who didn't reject that he was actually surprised Michael Edwards really with his with thirst for knowledge at that time and how much he wanted to learn from those analysts he'd spend a lot of time uh, around their office trying to learn things and along with actually Gary O'Neill you remember playing for Portsmouth he was uh, he's coaching at Wolves now and was also a, a youth coach for a little bit at Liverpool as well and Matty Taylor who's who's also gone into management himself they were the three players who were mentioned as always being in the analyst's office trying to learn things and not just trying to learn about you know the opposition that they were going to face next or how they could improve their own game but also looking at other teams across Europe and how they could play the game and and, and how they go about things and, and just trying to learn more about football in general really and the tactical approaches um, and it cited that Milan, AC Milan, the team of that time, and also Barcelona were two of the teams that Hughes was really, really interested in. Now, the Milan's team in that period, you'll think of the one that around 05, 07, who Liverpool came up against in the Champions League. They, were, they really were probably the best team in Europe at that time with the collection of players they had under Can Carlo Ancelotti and the, the tactics they used and it was really was a superstar team and then of course Barca maybe later in his time at Portsmouth with when you think in post Rijkaard and then into the Pep Guardiola era when you know he really just revolutionised that Barca team didn't he and apparently those are the teams he was kind of really interested in, in, in getting into with, with the analysts and, and looking at now he also of course he had this the fact he was captain shows that he already had sort of leadership skills he's a, a player whose voice will be listened to in the dressing room so he's really respected in that regard and because he was so interested in the tactical side of the game and analyzing things really the expectation at Portsmouth at the time was that look we're looking at someone who's going to go into management I mean you look at Gary O'Neill did he followed that route obviously Matty Taylor I think he was most recently at Shrewsbury Town so he has also gone into management so it seemed I guess at the time a bit of a no-brainer really that, that Hughes would step up and, and go into management once he hung up his boots but actually I think what, what had a big influence on his career is that he actually finishes his playing career at Bournemouth now He'd, he'd had two stints at Bournemouth, one where he played with Eddie Howe previously, and then in his last stint, he was actually being managed by Eddie Howe, and it's a conversation with him that apparently had a big influence in terms of what his next steps were going to be once he hung up his boots, and Eddie Howe sort of opened his, his eyes to the idea of maybe, okay, if he didn't want to go into management, maybe an alternative, and, and I suppose punditry was an option as well, it's always an option, isn't it? But an, an alternative route he could go to was to, to go into the boardroom and, and be kind of a a football voice in that area and, and really get involved in the, the technical side of the game and so that is what he did so as soon as he finishes at Bournemouth or, or pretty soon after that he ends up joining the recruitment team and, and working his way up through there uh, and obviously doing an excellent job because he eventually ends up being promoted to technical director now Around that time, Bournemouth, you know, some great achievements during his time at Bournemouth. I mean, I'm looking at a ninth place finish in the Premier League, a 12th place finish in the Premier League. They are relegated at one point during his reign, but you have to think for a, for a club of Bournemouth size, that's almost inevitable, really, that they're going to suffer a bad season and, and end up with a relegation, even with all the good work that they did behind the scenes. You know, you think they've got an 11,000-seater stadium. 
they really are punching above the weight to be in the Premier League. I mean, they, they, they really should probably be a, a lower bottom half of the Championship or, or maybe even a League One club with a stadium of that size. So the fact that they were able to be in and around the Premier League, they got relegated, You know, didn't respond the season after, but were straight back up the season after that. So some really good work went in around that. And as I say, I think that's testament really to what was going on behind the scenes because obviously that is a, a club that massively needs to, to punch above its weight to be in the Premier League. And they've been very very good since they came back in as well and and, and really steadied the ship and, and and you know again as they were beforehand a really established premier league club aren't they you know you, you think of them as a, a proper premier league team now and as i say that is testament to the work behind the scenes now key to that obviously having a good manager is is obviously important and the, t- the technical director will oversee those sorts of appointments but also signing players is, is a huge part of it and Bournemouth have been very good in recent years in terms of picking up maybe undervalued talent. Some of the, the fees they paid, and people will point this out, some of the fees they paid have been high, but once those players are in, you could almost double your money on them. I'm thinking of the likes of Nathan Ake. They pay £20 million for him, but he ends up being worth it, doesn't he, with his performances, and then he goes on to obviously make a move to, for big money to Manchester City. Dominic Solanke, at the time he signed from Liverpool, that looked like big money, but he is now such a reliable Premier League goal scorer as well. And Philip Billings, another one who comes to mind, who has come in kind of an undervalued talent and is a, a really good player for Bournemouth. In, in fact, one of those that I'm kind of surprised a bigger club hasn't come in for. And you know his record in terms of transfers, is loads scattered in there where you'd think that they are really astute business that he's done. And I think he also came onto Liverpool's radar in terms of what he was doing in the transfer market because Bournemouth were consistently competing with, with Liverpool for players now. Liverpool have a lot of faith in their ability to to find undervalued talent, don't they? So the idea that that this guy was coming up against them for a lot of players and that Bournemouth were effectively losing out only because it was Liverpool and they can pay more and they're a bigger club, uh, it it gave them a good idea that he was doing good work. A couple of examples of that are Joe Gomez when he arrived from Charlton Harvey Elliott coming in from, from Fulham, Andy Robertson from Hull. And also one one where Bournemouth actually did get the upper hand in the end was Lloyd Kelly. Liverpool were quite big on Lloyd Kelly, wanted to sign him. But in the end, he, go, he went to Bournemouth on the basis that he felt that he would get more regular football there. And again, it was just more proof as far as Liverpool were concerned that this guy knows what he's doing in the transfer market. It's actually interesting as well that one of the players that Bournemouth failed to sign in his time involved in recruitment was Virgil van Dijk at South, uh, uh, fr- uh, from Celtic. Sorry, Now, it's known that Hughes is a, a big Celtic fan, so he would have watched a lot of Virgil van Dijk and seen that he'd really stood out amongst that, that Celtic team. But unfortunately, when Bournemouth went to try and get a deal over the line and tried to snatch him from under Southampton's noses, then Southampton had done enough work to, to get that deal over the line. But I think in moments like that where you have even transfer failures... Okay, we may not hear about them in the, you know they may not come into the the public domain so to speak. But people behind the scenes they think well look he was looking at Virgil Van Dijk he knew how good this player was a few years ago before he went to Southampton. That's a guy who knows what he's doing with transfers and again within the industry things like that massively enhanced his his reputation. Now I think he's done that again in terms of on the managerial side as well. Apparently, uh, I'm, I'm told that the, the Bournemouth were very big on Roberto De Zerbi actually before. Uh, the, 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 after they'd sacked Scott Parker, uh, Scott Parker uh, and moved on eventually to Gary O'Neill, which, by the way, was a, an incredibly astute appointment, you have to say. But they were big on Roberto De Zerbi before he ended up at Brighton. So again, that failure there, it, it, it was blamed on Bournemouth not moving quickly enough, actually, and allowing Brighton to steal in, and that was the reason they didn't get him. But again, that interest, I think, tells you a lot about his ability to identify not just players, but managerial talent. And again, you look at Iriola, who they've appointed this summer, so highly rated, such a coup really for Bournemouth to get him and I know he's had a bit of a dip recently but I still think that's a very very smart appointment and that he is a a really really good manager who's going to be uh, extremely successful in the Premier League so again his talent ID is is, is right up there and again that you know as much as his friendship with Edwards Edwards is keeping an eye on this sort of thing and and being really impressed as are other football executives across football now of course, sporting directors or technical directors, as he was at Bournemouth, they do come across each other. They do the paths meet, whether that's at Premier League meetings or just speaking to each other about transfers. So they all—it's a small industry, and they all do kind of know each other as well. And I think in those situations as well, you get a good feel for the characters and what the strengths and weaknesses are. And so for Michael Edwards to to, to come across Hughes in this environment as he did when they were at Liverpool and Bournemouth, respectively. He learned a little bit more about about Richard Hughes and a, a, a little bit more how he operated and, and what kind of sporting director he was. Now, 
as far as Michael Edwards is concerned, and, and this is my understanding, is that there are almost two types of, of sporting director. One of them is more sort of involved in infrastructure and administration and logistics and those sort of big picture things. And, the, uh, and there's another type of sporting director whose sole focus really is the football matters, the transfers, the manager, managerial appointments and doing those sorts of things. Now, in that sort of infrastructure admin type, that, that operational uh, sporting director, you've maybe put a, a John Murto who's at Manchester United or or Dan Ashworth who's currently on gardening leave from Newcastle United but he's going to go to, to Manchester United we expect. And then on the, the football side and the, the more football expertise, Michael Edwards would probably put himself in that group and also he felt that, that Richard Hughes was in that sort of, that, that kind of mould really and that he's that kind of sporting director. And for that reason I think it's no surprise really that he sees him as the perfect fit to do the job he once did in terms of leading up Liverpool's recruitment. Uh, so you know that's the feel he got from him in all his dealings with him that he's a real football man who who who, who had similar le- areas of expertise to to Edwards himself, and for that reason he can put him in that sporting director role and know he will do it in a in a sort of similar way. Now his faith in him is is actually kind of an interesting one because he was so big on Richard Hughes as a sporting director and, 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 and so you know, convinced by his ability that in his uh, consultancy role at Ludonautics, which he will leave to return to FSG as CEO of football, he'd actually recommended Hughes to, to quite a lot of European clubs in terms of saying, you should look at this guy, the work he's doing is incredible. And another name who, who comes up actually, he was really impressed by was, was Dougie Friedman, who's at Crystal Palace. Now they have been really, really good in the transfer market of late. So though Hughes was alongside Friedman as two of the, the sporting directors he really admired. And in fact, he was quite surprised that Liverpool... When Julian Ward left uh, last summer, he was surprised that Liverpool didn't make a move for either of them uh, and in- instead went down the route where Jörg Schmatke came in on, on a sort of temporary basis. He was surprised. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, he'd been recommending Hughes to, to, to many clubs as well. So I, I suppose he will be quite, quite glad that nobody took him up on that, that recommendation because in the end, what's happened is he's had the ability now to bring him in as sporting director. And it's interesting actually to see those two working together which is maybe not something he expected it, it, uh, insiders sort of tell me that the very different sorts of characters actually that Edwards is very combative he, he, you know, he'll fight for what he believes in he'll, he, you know, he, and we know that he's clashed with the Jurgen Klopp in the past even though that's ex- what you expect in those sorts of working environments but he is a little bit more combative on that front and sort of a different character whereas Hughes is described as a bit more laid back a bit more calm and really, in theory, you can see that sort of combination of CEO of football and sporting director. Maybe that will help them work together, and that will will make them a really good fit for each other. And as I say, you know, I, I think I think Michael Edwards will be glad that nobody else jumped in and grabbed Hughes before he could, because that could be a really potent pair. And I think it's very very important as well that Liverpool have got those two in place now. They've got the structure that they need because obviously the next thing that comes down the line and the huge thing that's coming up this summer is, is is for Liverpool to appoint a manager, a successor to Jurgen Klopp. Now that is going to be an absolutely huge task, isn't it? But they've made all the moves now to, to, to show any prospective manager, look, we've got the structure in place to, to keep this success going. It's not fully reliant on Jurgen Klopp. We can still be successful at Liverpool without him because We've got all this structure. We've got we've got a recruitment team that is the envy of Europe. We've got we've appoint, we've made shrewd appointments in in in, in football executive uh, roles that that needed to be made, and so everything is in place for further success. So of course, Hughes' first job, as as much as summer transfers, will be part of it. His next job is is to come up with with who will be that manager to to fit in that that football uh, structure that Liverpool have put in place, and that is the big role. Of course, Xabi Alonso we know is the front runner. It's my understanding that he is the first choice at the moment, but I'm absolutely sure that Ruben Amorim at Sporting will will come into consideration, and also we know that Hughes admired De Zerbi, uh, a while back. So again, will he come into consideration for Liverpool uh, with the work he's done at Brighton? It'll be very interesting to see. Uh, which way they move with that but the good news I think for Liverpool fans is that the movement will happen on that now we accept, expect sort of an acceleration in Liverpool's pursuit of a new manager whether that, be, whether that be going to the representatives of the managers or going to the clubs themselves we expect that to really start moving now because they've got this football structure in place Richard Hughes has finally been confirmed appointed and Michael Edwards is, is overseeing it all so we should expect news to start to come in on that and we'll have to see who Liverpool go for it's going to be fascinating but 
but I just think it's good news that they can get in there. They've got other clubs to compete with. I'm thinking around Alonso. Bayern Munich really wants him as well, don't they? But Liverpool are ready to move in the managerial market now, and I think that is the most important thing of all. So going to wrap it up there with my summary of Richard Hughes and, uh, and everything we know about him so far. It's going to be really interesting to see what he does next. I'm also interested to know what you think about this appointment, whether you think it's a smart one, and, and which of those managers do you want to see him uh, get in as his priority now is his first big job he's got to do at Liverpool that managerial appointment do let me know what you think in the comments and as ever I'm going to leave it by asking if you can like and subscribe always helpful always helpful to get more subscribers on board in an international break as well because it's usually a bit quiet but I've got loads of video uh, ideas planned so keep uh, so you know keep watching and, and you'll see them soon and I will see you very soon